What's cracking, y'all? This is the first episode that we're diving back into the Behind the Business interview series where I sit down one-on-one with an influencer, an innovator in the fantasy football industry, in the space, and I just chat with them about their journey, how they came up, how they became successful, and these are people with all different backgrounds, hopefully to inspire you guys to take action and, and pursue some kind of creative endeavor, whether it is in the fantasy football space or it is uh, with anything in, in business and life. That's the goal of this entire series. If you've missed any of our previous episodes, I will link them down below. Today we have Addison Hayes at AmazeHayes underscore on Twitter. He is the creator of the website ffstatistics.com, an awesome, awesome resource that I had in my draft guide this previous summer. Addison is a kid, really. He is, um, sorry, no disrespect to you, Addison. He's young. He's just graduated out of college in December from Penn State. So this can relate to a lot of you guys. This is his passion, fantasy football. He went after it and he is going to continue to go after it. He hopes to make this his full-time job within the next year, two years hopefully. So he's a kid who came just out of college and he has his mind in the right spot. He has a lot of awesome things working in his favor. You guys are going to love this interview. He's going to talk to you about like what he was doing in college to pursue this or how he even got started, how he grew a following. And now he's building a team around himself. He has 14 people on his FF statistics team, including himself, writers, editors, all these different people. So he is at the beginning stage, very much like I am of where I see our platforms growing to. You guys are going to find a ton of value in this episode. It was awesome sitting down with Addison. So if you're watching this, thank you for coming on. If you guys enjoy the interview, make sure that you hit the thumbs up button down below. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We'll be doing one of these sit down interview episodes every single Monday. So if you're watching this on the 21st, there will be another one on the 28th, then February 4th, 11th. A lot of awesome guests coming up in the near future. So make sure you set your calendar, stop yelling, tuck your shirts in, butter your popcorn, join us, go follow Addison on Twitter. All of this stuff will be linked down below. I will see y'all at the end of the episode. So peace. What's cracking big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. We're diving back into a series that I started earlier this summer where I uh, conduct these one-on-one interviews pretty much with one of the bigger influencers or innovators in the space of fantasy football and the industry itself. And we do zero player analysis, no numbers, no statistics, nothing like that. Um, ironically, because we are joined today with the first guest of the series kicking back off. Uh, We did about five episodes throughout the summer, and we got a lot of positive feedback, so I wanted to keep these going. We're looking at the other side of the industry in terms of, uh, you know, social engagement and in terms of marketing and and business and the money behind it and these kind of things, because, you know, that is a real part of the industry because it's growing super rapidly, and I wanted to kind of get it out there and talk to people who, you know, have been successful or on the path to being successful in the industry and hopefully um, inspire some of you guys to you know start grinding and if, if this is something you're passionate about then this is definitely something you can undertake. Now today we have Mr. Addison Hayes here. You can find him on Twitter at AmazeHayes underscore or on YouTube FF Statistics. He is the creator of the website ffstatistics.com, a very, very awesome resource. I actually think I had that as one of my uh, my top resources in the draft guide I created last summer. So if any of you guys cop that, you probably have seen that in there. He also is a writer on a, a bunch of different websites, focuses a lot on Dynasty and things like that. So Addison, I am, uh, I'm pleased to have you on for the first episode to kick this series back off, man. Uh, introduce yourself to the people. Tell them a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, well, first, thank you for uh, for having me on. You know, I was excited whenever you asked me uh, and, and told me all about the series and what you were trying to do here, and I think it's fantastic. You know, I watched a couple of the episodes um, from from back in the summer. You know, Andy Holloway, um, Josh ADHD, you got James Coe and Brad Evans and all them, and uh, it's it's really fantastic. And I'm I'm honored to be a part of this series. If you uh, have me up there with like the other guys and stuff like that, so that's that's really fantastic. Um, but yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I'm Addison. I'm just uh, a kid who created a website just trying to make a name for himself in the fantasy football community. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's working out pretty well so far. I'm just, I, you know, I just graduated from college. Uh, so it, it's funny whenever you see a lot of these people uh, who are a lot older than you, not like a lot older than you, but like they're all like, you know, well into their adult lives and stuff like that. And I'm down here and, uh, mm-hmm. Me and me and my co-host uh, John Hope at uh, on the FS Statistics Pod. We always find different things that I'm 
I had no idea what it was or I'm too young for it. Uh, and, and he feels like he's so old, even though he's not. Um, so it's just, it's funny. Like that kind of dynamic, I think is really funny. Um, and, uh, a different spin on uh, a lot of my, uh, relationships in the fantasy football community as well. So it's just overall, it's just really fun. And I'm happy to be here talking with you about it. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm sure my crowd is going to get a lot out of this. I do have a, a big portion of my audience is the younger demographic. And that was another reason I was excited to have you on because, there aren't a lot of people our age. And I think I'm, I'm, if you just graduated college and I have to be a couple of years older than you, I'm 26. So I'm 22. Yeah. And even at that, I feel ridiculously young compared to the other people that are in the space right now. Um, and I think that's just a whole side of, of fantasy football. That's kind of untouched right now and untapped. And, and the market is really, you know, it's open there, but I kind of want to start off with, uh, you know, your, your baby, the FF statistics website. Now, there are a lot of very, 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 very awesome tools on there. Um, I don't know how you even started putting it together, but I wanted to know more about the website itself. Um, tell us, you know, first of all, tell us what was the idea or like the inspiration? What made you be like, um, oh, you know what, I'm going to create this website. You know, how, uh, what, what kind of background do you have that you can even put that together? And then, you know, tell the audience, I guess, which kind of tools you have on there so that they will use this after the video. Sure. Yeah. So basically I, I started, um, getting into the, the fantasy and dynasty community overall in the spring of 2017. Um, you know, fantasy football, like all of us basically is, has been a huge, uh, passion. Uh, I've been playing since eighth grade. So it's been about 10 or 11 years now. I just really wanted to get more involved into it. So I started writing, uh, I joined dynasty football factory um, as a, as a writer there, just, you know, getting my feet wet and getting into the community. Um, as I was writing articles over that summer of 2017, you know, I, I'm a, a stats and data guy. Um, so I was collecting all this data to use in all of my articles and stuff, you know, like collecting like saints, like team data. Cause I wrote an article on Michael Thomas, um, just all this other stuff. And, and I really didn't want to like delete any of it because I felt like I knew I would need it again. And one of, one of the biggest problems I found when I was doing uh, research for all these articles was that I had to go to like three or four different sites to find all this different data for, you know, one article on one player, you know, like I had like pro football reference and then there was like fantasy data and FF today and just like numerous other sites um, that I was collecting all this data from. And so over, after a while, I just started to create um, like a database in Excel uh, library of, of sorts. And I really wanted a way to just get the data that I had collected and kind of combined from, from different sources uh, like out into the community. And so it was funny, that semester of fall 2017, um, I was taking a class on R, because I'm a statistics major. Um, and that's where I graduated in. So I was taking a class on R, which, uh, you know, you were, you were talking about with uh, Josh ADHD. Hermsmeyer uses it as well. It's a fantastic tool. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend anyone who's even data uh, interested to look into R. Um, so I was taking it on that, and my professor said something about this thing called R Shiny, uh, which is a really powerful visual tool for, uh, for data, and you can make web apps and stuff like that. So that piqued my interest, and I... We were supposed to do that as a final project, and it was supposed to be like the last like month of what we were learning in that class. But I taught myself the majority of of our shiny. I think that September and into October, and he had given us what our final project was was to create a shiny app uh, with with a couple of group members, and I had it done in like the beginning of November uh, mm -hmm. with uh, two of my other friends. They're both fantasy football. Uh, nerds as well and uh, we we have a, a fantasy football club at Penn State so they're really into oh, wow. it they got the A and I got my website <laughs> so okay. uh, that's where FF Statistics was uh, um, was born out of and I just kind of kept adding to it and it launched um, last January 29th so we're coming up almost on the one year anniversary of the launch uh, and it's been you know, added to and updated and, uh, you know, just overall UI, everything has just been uh, constantly improved over the past year. And we have basically any data that you could want. I kind of want to make sure that I have 
anything that people could find that's not like uh, proprietary type data, you know, like reception perception or, you know, right. like tracking data that some of that's hard to do, like slot percentage and stuff. Yeah. Um, but everything else is kind of on there. You know, you got yearly uh, fantasy ranks and points. Um, the One of the cool tools that a lot of people, especially this time of year, uh, is the coaching tool where you can go back and see how um, players have performed under different coaches. Um, I know, like, whenever uh, Bruce Arians got hired, um, everybody kind of flocked to see how Bruce Arians' fantasy players have done <laughs> under his uh, regime. I went right there. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know you can see you can see what he did in Arizona and Pittsburgh, uh-huh. and then put that onto the the Buccaneers players. So um, there, the, and then you got you know weekly data and uh, split tools and uh, everything like that, and, and we just keep adding to it uh, more and more. Uh, and, and especially this off season, now that I don't really have school, it's just gonna uh, I'm just working on it constantly. <laughs> so I guess it derived pretty much from a lack of there being something in, in the marketplace, really. And I know like when I do a research, right, if I'm doing a video, if I'm writing a blog post, I have a bookmark that just says like fantasy football with like 45 different resources on it. And I've done it enough to the point where I know exactly where I need to go in order to find an exact stat or something. But for a lot of people, that's like that's such an issue. And one of the things I really try to uh, like relay to my audience is not I, I don't want to necessarily be like the best fantasy analyst. I'm not going to be the guy who gives you the best stats because there are guys that, you know, PFF that we'll do that for you, right? And we'll spend hours on one blog post. And I would rather, I will give my own twist on things, but I'd rather be able to kind of feed you the best information out there, whether it's coming from me or if I'm able to be like, this is an awesome resource that you guys need to be using all the time. Um, And like I said, yours was one of them. And it's cool to see that you're, you know, trying to think um, very broad and like trying to put all the stats together because as as a fantasy community, we obviously need to like, kind of uh, sharpen up. It's getting so so big, and there are a lot of these sites kind of popping up that try to aggregate the data. Um, but like one central site like yours, for instance, would be um, awesome. And, and, and the coaching tool, I actually wanted to kind of hit on something because when we get these new offensive coordinators or these new head coaches coming in, you know, everyone kind of flocks to the idea of, you know, for Bruce Arians or whatever, they're like, oh yeah, he did this amazing thing with Carson Palmer. And we just expect that to kind of translate into James Winston. I don't want to really break down like player analysis here per se. Now the tool is is awesome, but do you find that it might be more helpful to figure out who on the on the team is maybe calling the plays, or if you know like because a lot of people are, are quick to give you know attribute to a head coach and the quarterbacks coach and the offense coordinator for a quarterback having a big year, you know? And I I don't know if we as a community have really done a good job of being able to know, you know, for predictive purposes, which of those pieces is the reason um, that that quarterback played well or anything. So do you have like any, any thoughts or ideas on on just like that overall kind of like principle or, uh, or analysis on that? Uh, Well, it's it's hard to, there, there's not like data out there that says, uh, you know, like for instance, uh, the 2017 Rams, you know, uh, they had Sean McVay as the head coach and uh, LaFleur was the offensive coordinator, but LaFleur didn't call plays. McVay did. Right. But, but there's no way of really, there's no data that says that other than the fact that we just know that that was the dynamic. You know, we, we assume that the offensive coordinator is the one calling plays um, when sometimes that's not always the case. Now we can know who's calling the plays like, uh, take the Niners for example. Shanahan's the one's call, is the one calling plays. He doesn't have an offensive coordinator, so you know it's it's got to be him, right? So yeah. um, th- there is that sense to it, and that's why with my coaching tool, I like to have every coordinator and head coach. Um, so that's why you can go in and see Bruce Arians' numbers, and it'll show you, uh, you know, when he was in Pittsburgh, it shows you that he was the offensive coordinator there, and then when he was in Arizona, he was the head coach. Right. Um, so. Obviously, as a head coach, you're going to have some sort of pool on uh, what kind of uh, offense you're running and, and what kind of players get the ball and stuff like that. Um, that's kind of your job, but it's also the offensive coordinator calling plays. So, you know, there, there is that dynamic there, and that is a struggle uh, for a lot of us to kind of predict, um, you know, going into next year, especially with all these coaching changes. But that's why I like having both coaches and offensive coordinators. So you can go in and you can find the floor. Um, and you can see that he was the offensive coordinator for the Rams in 2017, but he wasn't the one calling plays. But it could be something that he picked up from McVay, and maybe that's one of the reasons why he was, you know, hired by the Packers and something that he's going to bring 
to Green Bay um, as well. And then you can look at what he did uh, last year in Tennessee. Yeah, exactly. And and LaFleur was like one of the guys that really made me think of this because he was a quarterback's coach in Atlanta when Matt Ryan had that MVP season, goes over to the Rams and was the offense coordinator or whatever. But a lot of people will just like stop there with the analysis when it's not like he's calling the plays in Atlanta, he's calling the plays in um, Los Angeles or anything like that. So I just think it's kind of like an interesting conversation to have because as we're getting more into, you know, as the industry is like innovating more, we need to like equip the people who are playing with more predictive statistics and and predictive uh, analysis and that stuff. But um, I think like your website in terms of like coaching and stuff is about as good as there is going to be in the market anywhere. So for the audience members, like if you're trying to see what the wide receiver one and the wide receiver two target share is under Bruce Arians head coach teams, this is a website to uh, go check that out. So there's a lot of a lot of awesome tools on there, and I'm sure there are going to be a lot of um, more awesome things coming. In that sense, I want to kind of talk mm-hmm. talk about like you personally, as this is kind of taken more of a, a step ahead as a project. It's not really so much a project anymore. I'm sure for you, as it is more like it's probably taken over a big part of your life now, right? Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> You know, as you've kind of grown in the industry and as you have kind of created a, a platform for yourself, how has your like mindset changed from this being like a school project to this being more of your life? Like, have you thought of it from more outside of, oh, I love fantasy football and I want to do this to like, if I go all in on this, this could be, uh, you know, a lifetime thing for me. You know, like how, wh- what's your mindset like with this? Right. Well, um, so it's kind of funny that you, you asked about that because, um, uh, FS statistics just became an LLC. So we're, we're moving kind of in that direction of a more business approach to, uh, FS statistics. You know, I, I got, uh, writers coming on and then we're going to start doing a, uh, subscription type service, uh, more than that season pass that I did, uh, over the 2018 season. Um, that's also still going to be in the mix somewhere, but we're moving towards a more subscription based website and and approaching it from a business standpoint so um in the back of my mind even when i was creating this you know the majority of it of the reason why i started was because this would be really fun and this would be a fantastic way for me to you know build my fantasy football portfolio and resume and eventually work towards a full-time career in fantasy sports i think that's the reason why all of us you know that's that's like an end goal for all of us here um, is to be able to do this full time. Really, it, it's something that is unique, and it takes a special person to be able to make that happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you need to have that kind of mark and that imprint in the fantasy community to be able to do that. And for me, that's what FF Statistics is. I'm trying to make this a full time uh, type ordeal. Um, so that's my mindset right now. Is trying to come up with how can I um, approach this from a business standpoint. And get it to where that I'm doing this, um, you know, as as a main source of income for me, you know, very similar to how like Rotoviz and PFF and you know even the fantasy footballers, even though they're not stats driven, but that's uh, you know their career. Um, so uh, that that's where I'm at right now, and I know I still have a long way to go, uh, but that's at least the direction that um, I'm starting to take the site in, uh, and it's becoming a lot more than just. Uh, a project that was done for school that has turned into this really cool website. It's it's now becoming a, a company and business mindset. And I'm excited for it. So Yeah, I mean that's awesome. Like where did you have any sort of a business background? Like school. Did you take any business classes? No. <laughs> no. This is all new for me. I'm completely jumping in head first and, and uh just kind of learning as I go. Um I have a lot of people advising me on what to do. Um John Hogue, my uh, my co-host that I mentioned earlier, he is a uh, kind of a consultant for a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, so he understands a lot of the business end side of, of stuff. And uh, the internet has been helpful. And mm-hmm. my dad has been helpful uh, as well. So uh, I'm, I'm learning, uh, but this isn't my background and it's not really my forte. I'd much rather just stick to the data side of it and have someone else handle the business side. Uh, but as of right now, um, I'm doing both. So. Yeah, I mean, I think you're going to end up enjoying the business side a lot more than you originally planned. And I think that's like a a big takeaway for some of the younger kids that probably think you need to have some kind of business background and have some kind of like experience prior to it. 
And the way I look at it is really if you're resourceful and you have a passion for something and you're committed to it, you're going to be able to figure shit out. You know, you're going to be able to find out what plugin you need for this or find out what software you need for this, right? You don't need to have sat through 30 business classes to find that out. Like I, um, I majored in international business undergrad and I have my MBA, but at the end of the day, what I do like on social media, and that's the way you're growing nowadays has absolutely nothing to do with what I learned in school. So what they're teaching you in business classes now, unfortunately, is very outdated. And that goes for a lot of things in school that aren't uh, very trade driven. If it's not a necessarily a subject where you need to learn exact sciences for it, or you need a certificate or something like that for it. I think like the education system, and this is not like the basis of our conversation at all, but I think the education system's in a really weird spot. But I thought it was interesting that you had just graduated school and you're, you're already pr approaching this from a, uh, from a business mindset because that had kind of kicked onto me like a year or two years ago. Um, but I had already been older than you at this point. So you're definitely going in the right direction. And I want to talk about, you know, now that you are looking at things from more of a business mindset, you said you're bringing on, you know, you have team members and whatnot. And I, I saw on your website, I believe it's 14 people on the team, including yourself. Now you have some writers, you have some editors, you have different people creating content, all this kind of thing. So talk to me because I'm, you know, this is as much of a learning thing for me as it is for the, for the people that listen and, and for the guests, I'm sure. Talk to me about like how you've approached building your team because this has been sort of a, a struggle for me, you know, empowering other people because it feels like, oh, it's something I've created. I don't know if I want to, you know, give this responsibility to other people because I might mess it up. And at the end of the day, it's my name on it and things like that. So I, I just want to know like, what's your standpoint from where you're at in terms of building a team, bringing on members? Like what, what do you look for first? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, you made a good point, you know, because you built it. So you don't really want to, you don't want to share responsibility with other people in case they mess it up. But that's only a concern. Uh, it, for, it was a concern of mine at the beginning, you know, I, because this is, uh, my baby and then, uh, you know, kind of handing it off to someone else. You're not sure if you should trust them or not, but that's kind of where you have to take a little bit of a leap, uh, with other people, but then you also have to know, uh, who you're bringing on, um, I'll, at least at the beginning, you know, to build a solid foundation. And at the very beginning, when I, when I started building the content team, first of all, Matt Williams uh, is my uh, my chief editor and kind of my partner in a lot of this stuff. Um, he was the one who approached me last summer and said about making a content team and doing stuff more on that end uh, than just having tools and stats and stuff and letting people figure this all out for themselves. Um, so he's really been the the main catalyst for a lot of the uh, content side of stuff on the website and so you know I was talking with him and we were talking about bringing on more people and uh, you know I already had a past relationship with John from Dynasty Football Factory we did the Superflex uh, pod together and then um, I, I brought on Peter Howard who's you know already he was already at DLF does all the stat stuff so he's fantastic I already knew him before uh, and then just a couple other people like Michael Zingoni uh, also a DLF, so he was, you know, also respected by them. So he, I, I trusted him, and he's also a numbers guy, um, college kid, just like myself. He's now uh, in grad school. At the very beginning, it was a lot of like hand picking people rather than just putting out a tweet and saying, "Hey, if you want to come on, you know, submit a, a paper, uh, and then I'll read it and then make my decision." It was very much a hand picked assignment, and uh, I think that worked out well. Uh, for me, at least building a solid foundation and a core of people uh, to start the team with. And then um, as we decided to move more uh, with content, more in that direction as well, um, then that's when uh, Matt has been asking people to come on and then, uh, you know, doing the, the paper submission and uh, really reading their work and making sure that they're a quality person to bring on. And uh, so we've added three more people I think in the past week, at least three, it's really hard because we have a Slack channel. So it's like, it seems like every day he's like, Hey, welcome yeah. this guy in. Yeah. So, um, but they've all been fantastic. I honestly, I can't say enough good things about our content team because, um, not only with the people that I've handpicked, but the people that Matt has brought on as, uh, as well, everybody's been absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, I just can't say enough good things. And I feel very, uh, lucky and privileged that this has been the team that has gravitated towards, uh, making content for my website. And I, I trust each and every one of them um, to be able to handle 
uh, everything that we throw at them and to be able to uh, represent FSS statistics in a fantastic way uh, on social media and everything like that. So I, I feel lucky. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's going to work for um, a lot of people as smoothly uh, as what it did for me, but um, that's at least the direction that I went. And I would advise people, you know, like yourself, if you're bringing more people on, you know, you've handpicked a couple people as well to help you out. Um, so that's the direction that I would advise people to go in is, is making sure that you know, first of all, who's coming on um, at the very beginning, handpicking them. And then when you start your expansion, that's when you can open it up to uh, the more, uh, a, a more public approach to bringing on people to, the, to your team. Yeah, there's a lot of good points made in there. I think what you said about, you know, just eventually you have to hand off the reins a little bit to other people. And I've, I also feel like I've gotten lucky. But the one thing I've kind of learned is that people will surprise you, right? People are good at what they do, right? If you give them responsibility, they will usually surprise you. If, you know, I have an editor that's awesome. And then I have my two friends that help me out on some of my podcasts. We have someone uh, doing some of the social posts organically and then a graphic designer and things like that. I think one of the big things you kept touching on is content team, content team, content team. I think one um, major point to take away from here for, <clears throat> for anyone that's in the audience that is a business owner, a small business owner. This is one of the things I learned semi-recently, probably within the half year. Luckily that this has been like the principle of what I've been doing all along, but you are, whatever your company is, whatever product or service you offer is not actually what you're offering. That is the second offering of, of your company. You're a media company first. You are in the content business. So you might offer the best statistics in the world that you are not gonna be find anywhere else on the web but no one's going to know about it unless you are putting out content at a mass scale. That's how you spread nowadays. You, you don't spread by being the best. You spread by putting out a lot of content that will take you to the next level. Once you are, you know, in the masses, that's when the best will separate from themselves and the cream, you know, will rise to the, to the top and whatnot. Bringing on team members, like you said, people that you know, and I mean, don't be scared to give people trial bases and don't be scared to, one of the things I listen to, I don't, are you familiar with uh, Gary Vaynerchuk? No, uh, I'm not. Okay, well, he's he's a, a brilliant marketer, a great like entrepreneur, super inspirational to me. And he always talks about, he's like, listen, everybody thinks they're good at hiring people. You think you could read people really well. He's like, the best people in business, the best bosses are not good at hiring people. They're good at firing people. And I'm not telling people to fire people or whatnot, but... Cut your losses where they are. If you come to the point where you're having, not a disagreement, but you realize quickly that someone might not be right for the team. That is, a, that's a point that's probably gonna be hard because you have to show, of course, empathy and you have to have EQ and stuff like that. But that's something that he always talks about. And he's always like, listen, you have to be very self-aware of of building the team because it, it's a tough thing, man. And, and I have trouble with like a team of five, eight people, right? And I get like anxiety thinking of these big businesses with 800 people. Like, how do you possibly run that business? It's, it's craziness, right? And you can only, do it by bringing on people that run other people and and you look at three people while they look at 300 people so it's uh it's been kind of a crazy experience trying to bring on a team and some of the things that kind of come come along with it because you're no longer so much someone who's in the trenches and doing everything yourself but you're almost like a human resource manager right you're you're managing people rather than what you normally would have done and, and crunching statistics all day um, so it's been fun looking at business from, from that kind of stuff. And, you know, while you're building this team, obviously you're going to be expanding your content and you're going to be expanding like what you guys are bringing to the table. So I wanted to ask you, what do you guys have in store for 2019? And this could be anything from new tools you're bringing on or new content platforms or, you know, the stage is yours. Yeah. So 2019, um, I feel like I'll say this every off season uh, at the beginning of every January, um, but 2019 is shaping up to be the biggest year for FF statistics, which is kind of funny because we've only been, um, uh, you sure. know, <laughs> a thing for a year. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm honestly, I am super excited for what this year is going to bring because um, I just had a, a, we had a Google Hangouts call with uh, everybody on the team, at least the majority of everybody who could make it. I think one or two people weren't able to. I called it the the state of the statistics kind of address. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we, we had everybody come on and we, uh, Matt and I kind of told everybody what our plan was for this year. Uh, they gave us feedback. We adjusted some of the stuff uh, based on that. Overall, uh, we have uh, plans for new tools. And then you saw uh, my tweet from late last night 
um, about so, adding. Uh, I saw you basketball. scheming. I saw you scheming. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out here, man. Basketball and Hell baseball yeah. data, which I already have. I just need to make tools for it. I don't know if that's going to be uh, an immediate project because I'm still working on a lot of the of the football end, and that's never going to stop. Uh, this will be majority football site, um, but that data will be really cool to have and just be able to expand uh, into those worlds as well. Um, so we'll, we'll be adding always more content, um, articles. We got podcasts and stuff. Uh, that's all going to continue. Uh, we've talked about getting into the Twitch world um, because I think personally. I think that's going to be the next big thing for fantasy football. Um, I think it's a really untapped world of live streaming that, you know, it's been very popular, popularized by the gaming community uh, with, uh, with Fortnite and stuff, you know, everybody knows who Ninja is, right? So like, yep. you know, that's, that world is going to become so much bigger for fantasy football um, along with YouTube as well. So I think uh, personally what you're doing is fantastic. I think, um, because YouTube also, not a lot of people in the fantasy community um, are into that and understand it as much uh, as, as you do. And so they're trying to get into it. And we're going to try and get into it as well. You should. Um, so, yeah. It, and so YouTube is going to be one of the big things. But honestly, Twitch, I have some plans for Twitch. And one of my coworkers um, is a Fortnite and gaming streamer as well. So he understands a lot of the... Uh, the live streaming like dashboard and stuff like that to make your your stream really cool and i kind of want like a, a show um you know because i was i was showing him matthew barry's fantasy show on espn plus mm -hmm. and i was like it'd be really cool if i could do this like live stream and he's like well you kind of can because can. you can make like yeah. different yeah slides and, and pages and stuff and that's why i think it's a it's a really untapped uh market and a lot of potential there uh for a lot of people some people are already in it um, but I don't think they're using it to the full advantage and full potential that, th that it possibly can. So I have a lot of big plans for Twitch and a lot of my, uh, team members are also on board with that. We got a draft kit coming out that we're working on currently. Um, it's, it's going to be huge. Um, but I feel like everybody says that, but I really <laughs> feel like ours is going to be really cool, uh, and, and has a lot of cool and interesting data on it. Um, and, and overall it's just going to be you know, a, a continuation of what we already done and then adding in the new flavors uh, of, of all this extra stuff. Like I already said, we got the subscription coming in. And so I'm really excited for 2019. And I think a lot of the fantasy community is going to uh, be really happy with a lot of the stuff that we're going to be putting out um, and and giving to the, the industry. So yeah no, th that's I'm perfect excited. that's perfect I, I have so many there's so many different points i want to dive into off of that um twitch is a great idea that's something me and my team have talked about i don't know the twitch platform that well um i knew it was big in gaming and i wasn't really sure how to incorporate fantasy football into it and if i sat down i'm sure i could but another thing gary v always says he said you should be trying to put yourself out of business because once someone else jumps on board to the new platform you're, you're kind of done there, right? Being first to market is a huge thing. So for the people out there that want to start something, don't try to start something that's already incredibly saturated. Now you can still have success on, on YouTube, but you're going to have a lot more, you would have had a lot more success had you started when I started like two years ago or on Twitter, if you started seven years ago, you know what I mean? So you have right. to be able to put in the work knowing you're not promised success. You know, it's a low probability of you getting to the top of the ranks, but there's no necessarily downside to it besides you putting in time and work. And if you're willing to do that, if it's something you're passionate about, it's not really going to seem like you're putting in that much time or work to it. So I think Twitch is a, uh, a great idea. And you talked about how like, you know, you're super excited for 2019. It's going to be your biggest year yet. And listen, I have the exact same mindset every soon as the season ends. I'm like, damn, I wish 2019 like summer was here already because that's when, you know, that's when all the engagement is and that's when right. things start growing. Now for you, I will say, listen, like this off season, when you're getting excited for the next season and stuff, you are going to have a period, right? They're going to be like four or five months where you don't see growth, where you're not seeing any sort of engagement near where you had during the season. And that's like where you're going to have a little bit of a mental pushback, like, oh man, I hope this all works out. And you're going to hear those voices in your head, but just know that all the foundation and the groundwork you're putting in right now 
when other people aren't doing it, that's what's going to make you successful during the season. Because I, you know, you have stretches of at this point, uh, content creation is almost my full time gig, right? And I have a stretch of the year where I'm not bringing in anywhere near um, enough money compared to like what I would be doing during the season. And that's like shit. Like, what happens if you do have a bad uh, football season, right? And you don't bring in a lot of things. So, like I said, it's just like growing that foundation and that groundwork is tough to do because football is obviously only around during six months of the year, whatever. So leading to dynasty football, there has to be, and this is something that I've been like trying to figure out how to properly monetize. And, uh, and for the audience out there, when I talk about monetization, that should never be the first thing on your mind. Just like Asin said, uh, when, when you're starting something out, it should usually be based on passion. It should be usually be based on maybe some avoid in the marketplace, um, not for money. Money should not be the reason why. But since you know we both have audiences, this is when you're putting in a lot of time and a lot of work to build those audiences. The reason you have audiences is probably because you gave off a lot of value, right? And they see you as someone that they want to follow. Since you have given off so much value, you have this audience. Now it's time to be thinking, you know, not selfishly, but like, hey, I put a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy into this. It's time that, you know, I get something that I deserve for it. So monetization in the off season has been something very, very, very difficult to uh, capitalize on. One of the big pillars, I think, of fantasy football that is very, very, very much untapped. And you probably don't even really think that way because you're in it every day. And it's like almost your main language at this point, probably. Dynasty, right? Dynasty Mm -hmm is getting more popular dynasty leagues for those of you who are unfamiliar it's uh you know you basically operate a fantasy football team as a gm there are large large rosters and you have a rookie draft every year so all the players are not put back into the player pool dynasty is something you play all year round basically which is why obviously you see the opportunity so for those people that are in dynasty leagues you will be thinking fantasy football all year round have you thought about what your plans would be from a business mindset during the off season? Because like I said, it's very, very hard to monetize because the, the masses, the majority of people don't think about purchasing anything related to fantasy football during that time. Yeah, that is that is difficult. Um, we have just, first of all, there's going to be dynasty content, you know, can be year round. Um, so that in and of itself is really easy to do from a business standpoint of just creating the content. Um, but like you said, getting people to listen to the content and stuff, it, it's easy to say that, you know, I know a lot of people who are very dynasty mindset, uh, on Twitter, you know, I got almost 4,000 people on Twitter following me. And I would say that a good majority of them are there for, uh, year round stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we have a very small, uh, world that we live in, uh, on Twitter and stuff like that, that isn't at all even close to what the actual fantasy players like out there are, you know, like it was funny. I was talking to Scott fish about this um, because he does his uh, serious XM show and his radio show and stuff, but they have people who can, you know, come and and do like a audience type thing. And (laughs) he told me uh, that when Demarius Thomas got traded, he brought up, uh, you know, watch out for uh, Tim Patrick and, uh, you know, he said, like, Sean Hamilton will, will also see a boost along with Cortland Sutton. But, you know, watch out for, like, Tim Patrick. And everybody in the audience was like, who? Like, who? who yeah. is that guy? Oh, yeah. You know, what? why is he helpful when he's still on the waiver wire, averaging, like, less than a point per game? He hasn't done anything. You know, that's not important. Tell me about Cortland Sutton. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I want to know about that. So that one really shot me because, I, uh, and like I said, in our little world, everybody knows who Tim Patrick is. And so, um, so that is, that is hard to be able to try and draw people in that aren't everyday dynasty players. And really to me, I think it's just, you know, creating content that, that is, that is valuable to people that makes them also want to play dynasty football and make them want to, you know, talk about football year round and stuff and kind of bring them into, uh, our world. Because I think once you get in here, everybody always talks about how, you know, what were, what were you doing before dynasty football and stuff like redraft is fun for a lot of people, but dynasty is where it's at. And, uh, you know, like how, how were you not doing this before? So I think it's a lot more about not telling people what to do in dynasty, but about bringing them into dynasty and making them understand what it is, what's going on. And I feel like a lot of people out there, 
don't really know what Dynasty is, but they're they're always playing Madden. They're playing, you know, the Ultimate Team. They're playing, uh, you know, Career Mode and stuff like that. And they're acting like the GM on there because that's what they enjoy. Mm-hmm. But they don't know that that's a thing in fantasy football. Um, so uh, if if there's a way that you can bring them in and make them understand what it is and how to play and all that stuff along with, you know, the rookies, because I feel like a lot of people really love college football, the draft process and stuff like that. So um, we started a, another podcast called the youth movement where um, the idea was uh, there's a lot of people who, even in the dynasty world, but there's a lot of people out there who don't really know who some of these players are coming out until the draft process starts, you know, after the, uh, the senior bowl and into the combine stuff. So Jesse and David, uh, are trying to do this thing where they're talking about college football players who are coming out of the draft, coming out to the draft, like in 2019, they were talking about them back in, you know, October and November um, and, and projecting where they would go so that you hear those names then. And you're not like just trading around out first round picks and stuff like that um, for players that you, you're, you're just doing it for the pick. You got to understand who the player is to be able to properly value that right. uh, draft pick. So um, I think that I think personally that podcast, Jesse and David, what they've done with that podcast is already fantastic, and they're going to continue to do that. Um, and I think that's going to be one of the big things that helps draw people into Dynasty uh, towards uh, FF statistics, uh, just because they're talking about college football and college football players as well as rookies uh, in the NFL, you know, as they progress and stuff through their uh, first two years. Um, so I think that's going to that's going to hook a lot of people in. And then we're going to try and uh, keep them in by doing Dynasty in a way that's not – like it's going to be more telling them how to play Dynasty, not telling them what to do with their Dynasty teams you know, right now. So um, I feel like that's a solid way to combat the monetization issue um, in terms of Dynasty Leagues with year-round. It's going to be really hard until a lot more people start coming around to the Dynasty format itself and just getting the casual – guy who uh works in like uh you know the this cubicle next to you and you only see him at lunch and then you talk about football for 30 minutes yeah um so until that actually happens everybody's gonna have um trouble monetizing over the the off season but i, I think it's heading in that direction 100 percent. and i'm really i'm excited for that as well because dynasty is fantastic i think it's the best way to play yeah fantasy football. yeah i think um <clears throat> i think it was a really good point you said on uh, not trying to you know, analyze fantasy football in terms of like the players and stuff, but educating people on what dynasty fantasy football is because I'm very obviously into fantasy football. I didn't start playing dynasty. I think my first team, I did one league two years ago. I started was the first team I did. And then this summer I got more into it. And now I have like three or four dynasty league teams. And there was a lot of comments on my YouTube videos. Like, Hey, you're putting out dynasty content. You're putting out dynasty content. I had no idea I had an audience for that. So I'm looking at it. I'm like, wow, that's, you know, that's a huge opportunity because that's, that's year round and educating them is something really smart. And you guys doing the content now for it is in a, in a sense, that's first to market as well. It might not be a social platform, but as these gain more traction and these types of uh, fantasy football leagues gain more traction, like people are going to start searching for them. And since you put in the groundwork and laid the foundation for it, you guys will be the first people that kind of come up for it. Right. We have all of like the, the OGs on Twitter and, and stuff that have been around fantasy football for a long time, but they stick mainly to season long. And now they dabble with DFS a lot of the time, but you don't have many people that are, you know, like the experts, the go-to guys in dynasty. Of course there are a few people, but if you're looking at it from the mat, I can't name a single person I know physically that plays dynasty league fantasy football besides myself. And, uh, I don't think that's out of the norm. I don't think most people know of or play it but as you know as we as a community start getting more hyped on it and we're like yo you got to play this you got to play this it'll start slowly integrating and i think it's because like everyone's unique right everyone likes different things and you can almost look at it from like so the fantasy industry itself is growing like rapidly right it's it's huge now but it's only at like it's here when it, it's going to be off the screen soon the thing right. about that is, is like, look at any other industry you look at like fitness right maybe in like the 70s all people thought about was I'm going to go for a run for 15 minutes or I'm going to go lift weights like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Now, when people think of health and fitness, there's bodybuilding, there is CrossFit, there's yoga. There's like 17 different types of yoga, right? And as an industry starts to get bigger and bigger, people start to niche down and they're like, oh, this is what I like about it. This is what I don't like about it. And you start creating 
soup like sub niches within niches and that's where i really see fantasy going because between redraft leagues like season long dynasty keeper best ball leagues are, are another huge like area where we know it like we're super familiar with it but the masses don't really know anything about it and i think that's you know those are where people who aren't in the industry yet or who haven't really started can find the opportunities and the openings to make a name for themselves because you can't just say you're going to go in start a podcast and talk about season long and expect to succeed because that's being done by 95 percent of the people in the industry now but there are so many crevices that you can find success in so i just think like there are so many ways to diversify yourself and i think you guys are i mean you looking at it from a business standpoint is, is so important because no one does that in our industry. No one's really thinking of it from a, a, like a business marketing perspective. The fantasy footballers were the first people to really do it like that, you know? And you've seen the massive success they've had. I, I think that they are awesome. Like their entertainment value and their information value is top notch. But there are people who are better analysts than they are. And I'm sure there are people who are, you know, funnier word for word than they are. They just have the total package and they went all in on that, you know, and they just did something different. So you don't need to necessarily be the absolute best at what you're doing. You just need to find something that really, um, that I guess hasn't, hasn't been done yet in the marketplace, if that makes sense. And I think you guys are definitely going in the, in the right direction for that. Yeah, I hope so. And I, I mean, everything, uh, that you said is, is a hundred percent true. And, um, just finding that, that niche, like you said, and personally when dynasty to me, when dynasty fantasy football is going to take off is when ESPN starts coming onto it. Um, and they start having it as, uh, part of their platform, uh, dynasty league, uh, you know, customizing and everything like that. So not a lot of people know who my fantasy league is. Not a lot of people know who sleeper is mm -hmm. or flea flicker. Um, everybody's playing on Yahoo and ESPN primarily. And so once ESPN gets the features to be able to support Dynasty Leagues, that's going to be 100% what's going to start to take over. And that's going to be the start of the leap into Dynasty becoming um, just as popular as Redraft is because, um, you know, once Matthew Barry starts talking about it, Mike Clay, all he does is like do some rankings, it seems like, <laughs> yeah. uh, and a little bit of analysis. But Really, he was he was how I even found Dynasty Leagues was uh, my friend and I found his rankings and he had OBJ number one and then some other guy number two. And we were like, why? Like, we didn't really understand. Like, that was OBJ's, like, second year. Um, and, and we didn't really know why he had OBJ at number one overall in mm -hmm. redraft. When it wasn't redraft, it was Dynasty. Um, but once that starts to become more of the main focus, uh, or even not even the main focus, but even up, up to par with where redraft is, uh, from an ESPN standpoint, that's when it's going to take off. And then that's when uh, people are going to start gravitating towards um, dynasty leagues and, and content being made for dynasty uh, fantasy football. Yeah, as well. I, I think uh, I, I think you're right in a sense that if they start doing that, the problem with that is like Yahoo just opened up half PPR leagues this year. They just started yeah. doing half PPR leagues. So Dynasty Leagues, I feel like, is so far off their radar from, like, putting it on their platform. So when I say, like, put yourself out of business, I feel like they're putting themselves out of business by not offering these things. And there are going to be the other platforms like MFL and Sleeper and Flea Flicker and things like that who eventually will rise to the top because I think you know, they leave a lot to kind of be desired in those, um, in those leagues in terms of, like, settings and customization. But that's something... Um, that I think if you're like a website creator, if you're really good at coding, create a dynamite dynasty league website or something like that, because that market is also very untapped. Um, you know, in terms of when it's going to hit the mainstream. Yeah. Like if, if one of those platforms started offering it, yeah, it would hit the mainstream. But I just think I don't I, I don't think they take this as seriously as the people like within the industry do um, from like a production standpoint i guess like obviously matt barry and michael clay are, are aware of what dynasty is but the people who actually create the sites and and code the things and things like i think they're very far off from that actually hitting um hitting the mainstream there although i would i would like to see that kind of take off there um and i'm gonna actually i'm gonna need to have you back on the channel to talk some some actual dynasty analysis because i want to i want to break that down a little more throughout um, throughout the off season. That's something I haven't really put out um, content wise. I want to talk about this previous season, the 2018 fantasy season. And I want to talk about, cause there are a lot of things that I know I learn after every year, right? Like 
the, the season ends and there's a lot of shit I got wrong. There's a lot of shit I got right. And I'm like, ah, uh, this is something that I will take with me next year. Like what are one of the biggest takeaways or lessons learned or something like that. So from the 2018 fantasy football season, what are um, your top, I guess, takeaways, lessons, whatever it is that you're going to bring with you to next year? could be analysis. It could be whatever. Not just business-wise? Uh, it could be anything, anything you want to talk about. Well, I mean, first of all, just from uh, from playing uh, in 2018, um, I went into it as very zero RB, and that didn't work out too well. <laughs> it worked out enough if you had the right players, but that's how it is every single year. Um, you know, like if you drafted James White or whatever. I really think I'm going to go into next year doing a one RB approach, uh, which would be like you need a running back in the first two rounds, um, something like that. But um, that's something else that I want to kind of dive into more uh, as we get into the summer. Um, and one of the, one of my ideas for Twitch is to do uh, Fantasy Pros mock draft streaming um, and, and being able to – because you can go in and you can pick – um, how many teams, where you're picking from, your scoring, and everything like that, and uh, seeing what type of players you can actually get where. Um, and, and they have their uh, algorithms and stuff for, for the, uh, the computer auto-picking. Uh, but that's where it really helps me to test out draft strategies and stuff from different positions and being able to understand, um, you know, at the top of the draft, you're going to want to take a running back, but at the bottom of the draft, it might be more um, – in your favor to go uh, running back wide receiver or wide receiver than running back, uh, something like that. Uh, so that, that's something that needs to be fleshed out more in the summer. And one of my ideas for uh, Twitch content, uh, so then people can follow along with uh, not only with my process, uh, but understanding the types of players that they can get and where, so that whenever they go into their draft and they're at like the seven spot, the seven spot, you know, they, they know what to expect and, and they know, uh, who to look for uh, around when. And of course, all that comes into, you know, every league is different. So if it's a home league, you know, Patrick Mahomes might go in the first round. Yep. Uh, just because <laughs> everybody knows who Pat Mahomes is. There's different things uh, to do with all that. But I think that was one of my biggest takeaways from 2018. Um, from a business standpoint, this was kind of, uh, this was our first year. Um, and it was our first in season. So, there was a lot of stuff that, that I learned. Um, first of all, I didn't think there would be so much work um, <laughs> in, in terms of keeping up with ha, 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 ha. in season. Yeah. I knew that it was a lot of work, but I didn't know that it was a, a lot of work. <laughs> so um, it was kind of funny that I, I, I underestimated um, just exactly how much work it takes to uh, upkeep a website and, and do content in that sense um, from a – a website point of view, you know, like I had written articles for Rotoballer. I did consistency articles. I had a weekly series. Um, so that was every Friday it would come out. Um, so that, that wasn't too bad. Um, but I was also in school last semester, uh, over the, the season. So, um, I was kind of juggling a lot of different things at once. Right. And um, that's why, sorry to interrupt you, but that's why, I, like I asked the question before, you know, how did your mindset shift from, Oh, I'm going to be writing an article once a week for whatever.com to, okay, I have my own thing. Now, not only do I need to write the content, but I need to publish it on my website. I need to think about SEO. I need to think about putting it on other platforms. I need to think about managing the people that are doing my content. You know what I mean? So there's so many pieces of the puzzle that go into managing a, a media company, basically. Um, and I just think it's interesting to hear people's takes on it because you even got to think about, you know, growing your email list and, and all of these random things that pop up from a business sense. Um, so sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but no, but yeah, that's, um, a lot of that stuff was, um, a lot of things that I kind of learned, um, over the past season just mm -hmm. from, you know, not doing it right. or, or not having done it before and then now having to do it. Um, you know, that's so, so that's kind of where, you know, you gotta, you gotta bring on the, your, your team and stuff. You gotta have people that you trust to kind of assign different things so that it's more manageable for, for you and for the other people and for the part of the site. So, um, you know, like you, you said with the email list and stuff, we're doing, we're starting a newsletter, um, that's going to be starting in February. So, um, I got, um, uh, Rebecca Jones, uh, to do the newsletter and she's a technical writer by trade. Um, so that was like basically a hundred percent job made for her. 
And so I, I gave her like full control over that. And, uh, of course, like she's coming back to me with all these other things, but yeah. that's just one example of how you can kind of pass on responsibilities, um, to other people who are, uh, more knowledgeable and more prepared to do that. And then that way it's going to be better for everybody involved. So, um, that was one of the things that I, I had to teach myself, um, was to be able to share the workload like that, because once you do that, then everything is just better because you're, you're happier. You're the content you're putting out is better because you're putting more time into it. The content they're putting out is better because they're putting more time into it. And it's also something that they love as well. So, um, if you can find ways to be able to do that, um, your whole entire site and your business is going to be all the better for it. And the, the consumers and the users are going to be much happier and, uh, value your product a lot more, uh, when, whenever they, that is all happening on the back end. Yeah, exactly. And that's something I talk about a lot. Um, I'm, I put out vlogs on my YouTube and a lot of it, it's just like my life behind the scenes, but a lot of it is talking about business and, and you know, what's going on behind the scenes of that stuff. And, you know, like the 80, 20 rule or the 90, 10 rule, whatever it is like, right. 90% of your income or, or the results come as a result of 10% or 5% of the actions you do. Right. So you have to figure out what is it, what's that 5% or what's that 10% that, that you're passionate about that you love doing, right. And that, you know, drives the results for your business. So for me personally, it's literally just making YouTube videos about fantasy football. Once you figure out what that is, you have to try to devise a plan, a process, a team, put a team around you that can take care of the other parts, you know? So like you said, once you start to do that, you free up time for you to work on the things that give you the most results or the things that you're most passionate about. So it's it's figuring out what it is that drives you, drives the results for your business, and then putting processes and systems in place and team members in place to make sure that you're only doing what you actually love doing. So that's a really good point. It's really interesting from where we're at because we're kind of on the same playing field right now, I feel like in terms of where we see things going and, and where we're at right now and, and growing and stuff like that. So it's going to be fun to kind of watch each other's journey as as we progress in the industry. And I, I could tell just from having this conversation with you that you guys are going to do well for sure. And I'm excited to, to watch you guys grow and see what you have in store for us in uh, in 2019. And I know we kind of took away a lot of different things from this conversation, but I do like to leave the audience with one or more, whatever you have for us, actionable tips. If you're someone trying to break through in the industry or just trying to start anything in general, whether it's you know a blog or a YouTube page or a business, do you have any actionable advice for these people starting? Yeah, so basically you have to, you know, we've, we've said it numerous times uh, today already, but you have to find something that you're passionate about, but then also something that's not really being done and it can be done, but you can put your own, you know, your own flavor to it, your own spin, um, make it unique, make it you and make sure that, um, you're not just photocopying what everybody else is doing and, and, and just, you know, being part of the crowd. You have to find a way to separate yourself and, uh, establish yourself as your own unique identity and being able to make it valuable and, and, and make people realize that they need what you're putting out so for me you know like i came in as a stats guy and i felt like i was kind of naive about the way that i approached and, and coming into the fancy community because i didn't really know who josh adhd was i didn't know who josh hermsmeyer was i didn't know who a lot of the people at pff were um so like i wasn't really aware that all that stuff was being made as well so i kind of came in did my thing and then when i saw what they were doing kind of you know pivoted a little and uh, took it in a different direction. So, you know, what Hermsmeyer and ADHD are doing with the same tools that I use, it's unique and perfect for them. And what they're doing is absolutely amazing and insane. And, and I'm just going a different direction with it um, and making it more um, of a, my own website where ADHD is making tools for uh, a website as well that's also as actionable. Uh, and then Hermsmeyer just has all this analysis and everything uh, for anyone. Mm -hmm. And, um, so really you have to come into, you don't have to know exactly what, you know, you want to come into whatever you want to do. Like if it's a, the fancy community, for example, you don't have to know exactly what that is whenever you first join. Um, you know, like I came in, I just wanted to write. I just wanted to be involved, uh, talk to other people uh, who were as passionate about football as I was because I wasn't getting that here. 
you know, my, my college sucked. I didn't really know people. Um, when I was at my local community college before I went to, uh, you know, Penn state Maine university, I was at the uh, branch campus. So like, I just wanted to, to talk to other people who, uh, outside of my little friend group of other people who didn't really know football as well, as much as like I did. And, um, so that's kind of where I started. And then I, I took it into the direction of creating FS statistics and everything like that. That, that would be, I think my biggest piece of actionable advice to people trying to get into the fantasy community, trying to get into whatever community that they're doing. And then also, you know, when you're on social media, don't be a dick basically. <laughs> Um, because there are a lot of people out there who will, um, are trying to build something and people knocking them down is very unnecessary. Um, and I think, um, you know, people say don't let it get to you, but sometimes it does get to you and it gets really annoying. Um, cause, cause I've, I've had my fair share of, of people who, um, either, you know, think I'm an idiot or whatever like that. And, you know, they don't use my website or whatever. I, I you know, it's, it's easy to say I don't care about that, but um, sometimes it, it does get to you. But I use it as motivation um, and, and try to not – my goal is to not get that stuff whenever I make uh, new tools and stuff. Like how can I make this tool so good that nobody can say anything <laughs> negative about it, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that that's kind of the motivation that you need um, whenever you, you face the, the negativity of stuff like that. Um, so, and it's also always nice whenever you're coming, when you're first coming in to, uh, build relationships with other people and make yourself known as this like great, uh, person who's coming in and just wants to be a part of the community and, you know, just, just wants to be here to talk and, and don't put anybody down. And, um, that's the best way. If you give out positive vibes, everybody else is going to get positive vibes back to you. Um, so I, I always feel strongly about that. I don't know why. But that's just one of the uh, one of my biggest takeaways from being on the uh, the fantasy Twitter community for the past two years um, is just that we have a tendency to be very argumentative and very uh, you know negative towards other people and everything that everybody's making I think is fantastic um, as long as we're making the community a better place and better for everybody involved in it then the the community itself uh, should be just as receptive and and as amazing as it is in my eyes whenever um, you flip past the negativity and stuff and, and, and see it. So um, those would be my biggest advice and takeaways and stuff. Yeah, the Twitter community is definitely kind of a funny one. I, uh, I, I've i grown... It's not Reddit, but... <laughs> no, I, I've grown to, to like it less and less because you just see more nonsense in the threads all the time. Every time someone puts something out, there are so many negative people. Um, but back to your point, like, you know, you try to make a tool in which people can't say anything negative about it. And that's kind of how I approach my player analysis too. And I brought this up. It's just like, if I'm going to analyze a player, I want to break down every viewpoint of it. Like if you're going to come at me from this angle, I want to make sure I have backup for that and telling you why you're either wrong or if it's a good point, then maybe I need to change my point of view. So I think it's about seeing it from other people's eyes as well. If you're going to come out and just um, uh, initially assume that what you're doing is correct or what you're doing is the best thing, imagine that you're someone else looking at your work, reading your work, watching your work. You're going to get a different viewpoint. And then you're like, oh, you know what? I, I had never seen that side of things before. And I think that's something that can help you kind of adjust your work and just minor tweaks. And, you know, when you start something, it's going to be shitty and it's probably going to get negative feedback and you got to be okay with that. And you will learn to get better at things. Um, And I I just can't stress that enough that it's a long process. You have to be in it for the long haul or don't be in it at all. And for the people that don't like your work, right? Listen, if you are making work for everyone. If you think your thing is going to hit the masses, then you're not making work for anyone. That's why we keep going back to this niche. You got to have your audience in mind. It won't be for everyone, but that's a good thing at the end of the day, because as the industry grows, the niches will start coming out and that's when you can make your place for it. So I think that was awesome actionable advice. Thank you, sir. Um, One thing I will say, I know you, you talked about on Twitch doing like live streams of mock drafts. I do mock drafts all the time throughout the summer, like live streams right. on YouTube. That's a way for you to grow on YouTube. If you want to grow your channel for you, because YouTube is owned by Google, right? They're a search engine. That's all they are. They are a video search engine. So those are some of the most searchable things. If Addison, if you put up a mock draft tomorrow on your YouTube channel and title it 2019 fantasy football mock draft, 
that will be the most viewed video on your channel by far. I, I could I could promise you that within a week it'll have more views than all of your other videos combined. Because so I looked at some of the titles and they're good quality content, but you have to think of it from you know a search perspective. You know, mm -hmm. so that's what I suggest to you. Look when, when you're putting up videos, especially on YouTube where it's a search platform, go with more uh, general titles and things like that, so people will be be able to find it. SEO is amazing, man. So that's, that's some really intricate stuff that I didn't really uh, understand at the beginning. And it's it's a acquired skill more than just uh, knowing, you know, how to how to make your stuff, being able to be, you know, uh, well searched and, and for people to find it easily mm -hmm. who aren't necessarily looking for it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, that's fantastic. In my the back of my head, um, my original idea was to stream it on Twitch record it and then put it on YouTube mm -hmm. as well. So then you kind of have both platforms going at the same time. Um, I don't know why, but I feel like live streaming on YouTube is just weird to me. Maybe it's just because I'm, I also enjoy the, the Twitch gaming aspect of it. Like I'm a huge Fortnite player as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I see that almost on a daily basis. And to me, YouTube has never been uh, streaming. It's always been, you know, anybody can put a, a video up. And, and that's what it's always been. So maybe I need to flip my mindset uh, more on that as well. Um, but that was my uh, original idea was to stream on Twitch, record it, and then put it on YouTube as well so that it's available to uh, anyone on those certain platforms and stuff. And then obviously you're going to social media share it and everything like that too. So Yeah, I mean that works too. I do I, – not all my mock drafts are live streams. Sometimes I'll do it, record it, and then throw it up later. But um, in terms of like that sort of content that plays well, anything if literally if you put up a video that just says like top sleepers for 2019 fantasy football, top busts, those things with very general titles will get you a shit ton of views. So I think people have kind of hacked their way and I hate doing that. I hate making those the main source of my videos, but like at some point you kind of have to play the game, right? Because that's how you're going to grow on those channels. So um, yeah, you could do that. I think the more the more places you put your content, the better. And live stream, I thought was a little weird too on YouTube until I did it and then you know, before Sundays, if I went on live at like 11 a.m. before games kicked off and I'd have 300 to 500 people in there, I'm like, this is pretty fucking cool. You know what I mean? And right. the live stream stays on there and people can watch it later. So it's like, you know, you not only get the actual engagement and that's that's big brand building, too, because when you're on a live stream, you know, you're improving it basically. And they're show, you're seeing, you know, your raw personality. And that's what I think really builds brand at the end of the day is them getting to know you as like a person. So live stream is one of my favorite things to do. Even though, like, half the time, legit, I wake up on, like, Sunday mornings, I'm, like, kind of hungover. I'll turn on the live stream and be like, what's up? Stop asking me fantasy football questions, and I'll just, like, kick it with my audience. And I think that's, like, that has been something that my audience likes, you know? And uh, it's about testing it. And a lot of things are weird. And if you think it's weird, I would say it's probably the right thing. Anything that, like, starts off feeling weird is probably the right direction because enough people think it's weird, so they stay away from it. And when you fade the public, that's when you start making moves. That's that's how I think of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will leave you guys with that. And this was a, a really good discussion. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you go follow Addison on Twitter. Make sure you follow him. Um, go subscribe to his YouTube channel. And I will link his podcasts and any of the other things we mentioned throughout the video down below in the description. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed, if you got some value from it. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. We'll be back with another one of these interviews next week. Monday. I'm not sure who the next guest is going to be, um, but this was an awesome one. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Addison, thank you for coming on, man. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, like I said, it's uh, it was awesome for me to uh, to get the message from you to be able to come on here. I uh, loved the series before, and uh, so I'm just I'm really happy that we had this discussion. I think it was fantastic, and I learned a lot of stuff. I hope you learned something as well, and I hope everybody else uh, out there uh, watching it also learned. Uh, from from what we just talked about here um so thank you man for for bringing me on i, I honestly i really enjoyed everything that we just did so as did uh, I. fantastic as did i my man all right peace out audience